Hello, it's Carrie again. I wanted to welcome you back to our webinar series that serves as a roadmap to your cybersecurity maturity model certification. This third webinar will review the controls relevant to CMMC level three, which applies to organizations that handle, transmit, or store controlled unclassified information. The opportunity today will clarify the rules and a Q&A will be invaluable. Please remember to access the NeoSmart portal regularly. It features new industry articles, updates from the CMMC accreditation body, and the compliance gap analysis that you can do at your own pace that's vital to CMMC compliance. Our next webinar will be introduced by our new L3 Harris Director of Supply Chain Cybersecurity, Jeff Trinidad. That session will explain the most advanced levels of CMMC. I'll be back for our final webinar in mid-August. I'll now turn it over to David Carlino, a principal security consultant with our partner Neosystems, to take you deeper into level three. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Carrie. This is David Carlino with Neosystems, and today's presentation is very much about CMMC level three. Uh, this is the third in our series of five presentations sponsored by L3 Harris and delivered by Neo Systems. Um, the content today is going to focus um, on level three, level two, level one, but not on level four and five. And this will be a technical discussion, so I imagine you guys are going to have questions. Um, those questions are very important to us. That's very much the point of today's conversation to help you understand this um, at a detailed level. So there were two presentations before this one. Uh, delivered by Ed and Joe from my team. Those are up on the portal, um, neosmart.neosystems.cloud. You guys should definitely navigate there and find those and watch them. If today you're looking for information about what level am I at, how do I know what level I should be aiming for, what kind of dates should I be expecting for audit, uh, for passing, for seeing this in contracts, Ed and Joe do a great job of covering details like that in the first two presentations. So I would encourage you to go download those uh, slides or to watch the webinars online. They are extremely helpful and do provide a good foundation for today's session. To do a quick recap um, of where those guys took you in the first two sessions. The cybersecurity maturity model certification is new. It is going to cover all DOD contractors um, and it is designed to cover un controlled unclassified information and federal contract information. So this applies to the entire defense industrial base, the DOD supply chain, and it is very much aiming at small businesses, contractors that do or do not necessarily possess CUI or FCI, but um, as a DOD contractor, they will be covered. And it's designed to have three levels um, to get you up to what was the original standard for all of us, NIST SP 800-171. So level three is based to uh, is built to, to basically follow that same NIST 800-171 model. And level one and level two are to help you get up to that level three. So pretty much everybody here today, you should be looking at level three of the five levels of increasing rigor. And at the end of this process, you're going to go through an independent third-party assessment rather than a self-attestation as you were used to before. Um, and with all of that scary upfront stuff, the easier part of this is that it is a five-year rollout. Um, so there will be some time for learning, for getting your ducks in a row, um, but you do need to get started if you want to have a chance at it. It is not necessarily the simplest thing. So we're going to go through the details of the, um, the domains today. So the lingo. As we get into this, you're going to hear me use specific terms. Um, these terms are going to be important to you understanding where we're at in the control set and how to interpret what I'm talking about. So the CMMC model is made up of uh, 17 domains. These domains, um, for anyone who's familiar with NIST 800-171 or NIST 800-53, the term domain is very close to what the term control family used to cover. So NIST 800-53 had 18 control families, 800-171 had 14 control families, and here with CMMC, we're looking at 17 domains, uh, the original 14 control families from 171 and three additional. And the term here, domain, 
uh, we'll see throughout this documentation. So important to remember that highest level uh, category. In order to achieve a domain, um, when you go through your audit, your auditor is gonna be talking to you about processes, capabilities, and practices. The main takeaway from this is that processes are gonna be more of a procedural, procedural activity where a practice is going to be more of a technical activity. Um, typically, you're gonna to link together individual practices to achieve a specific capability. Um, the reason that this is important is that we're gonna go through how many practices are involved at each level. So when we get to level three, you're gonna see 130 practices. And each of those practices um, is important to achieving a particular capability. Um, you'll also hear about processes that they want documentation about. And all three of those things are gonna to combine to help you become compliant and mature in the eyes of an auditor in a single domain. So some lingo, not the easiest way to start out, but you'll hear me use these terms, terms and wanted to get them, get them out of the way up front. So the level three progress from level one, level two, level three, those will all be in focus today. Level four and five you'll hear about in future webinars, but um, not a thing that we're gonna discuss today would go to a level where you're doing something proactive. So this should be the category where you've defined everything in your environment, you've documented it, you've written down your processes, um, but you're not necessarily going above and beyond to evaluate, are these processes that have been given to me by the CMMC organization, are they effective? Uh, that level of question is gonna get you more into a level four maturity where you're doing a lot more in detailed risk analysis. So today, level one, two, three, uh, the next webinars will cover, cover level four and five. So let's talk about level one. Level one is obviously the simplest. It's made up of 17 individual practices, technical activities, and mainly we're talking about protecting contract inf information. So if you have a contract that says something like FCI uh, in it or the has the FAR clause in it, the data itself in that contract, if it's never been given to the public, is considered private. And in order to make it private, you need to identify the people who can access it and have some way of limiting their access you need to sanitize the media that's storing it when you're done with it so someone doesn't steal it after the fact. Um, and a couple other things here that are gonna be of a basic level. And the important takeaway here for anybody at level one is that they really don't need to document these and they don't even need to really do them in exactly the same way every time. They need to perform appropriate practices, um, but that's about as far as level one is gonna get you. You can tell with 17 practices, no documentation and not very much maturity, this is probably a pretty uh, low bar for most of the people in this audience. As we start to talk about level two and three, it'll become more like you're used to with 800-171. Level two. Um, level two is very, very much a stepping stone. This is not meant to be the place that you will stay forever. The main thing you'll see is from 17 practices to 72 practices, quite a big uplift. Um, it's a big uplift because it's intended really to get you to level three. So this is supposed to give you a chance to understand what some of the more difficult controls are, uh, to flesh out your system security plan with an additional um, 65 controls, 55 controls here to, to help you to understand a wider variety of the things that are gonna be necessary at level three. So step one in that process with documentation is always to write policy. Policy is going to say something like, I will uh, enforce at my company XYZ standards and plans, um, one of which is going to be your system security plan, uh, very likely one of which would be an incident response plan. And within each of those documents, you're going to have processes and procedures that you expect your um, workforce to follow in order to achieve, again, your capabilities lists underneath all of your domains which brings us to level three. David, this is Ed, let me interrupt real quick. I have a question coming in from the audience. Um, is, is if, I'm, if, if having CUI means I'm subject to level three, do I also have to satisfy levels one and two? You do. Um, the maturity part of the CMMC um, abbreviation gets at 
you can't achieve level three without having done the basics of level one. So when you go through the control set, you're going to see numbering with a control or a practice saying something like AC dot one dot and then another set of numbers. And we'll see actually on, on a slide here what, what that looks like. But that is to indicate this is a level three control. Um, every level three control requires that level two controls are in place, requires that level one controls are in place. They are meant to be a stepping stone of controls. Good. And I'll, I'll encourage the audience members too, if you have other questions, please send them in in the attendee questions and we'll answer as many as we can live on the air today. Yeah, thank you. I just mentioned what a control number would look like. This slide has a lot of data on it. If you're going to take one screenshot of one slide, I would encourage it to be this one. Um, when we talk about NIST 800-171, we were looking at a control set with 110 controls in it. When we talk about uh, level three, we're talking about 130 controls. So what are those new controls? This is the new control list right here. Um, so when you, if you've gone through your SSP, your system security plan, control by control, and looked at NIST 800-171, these are going to be the controls that you need to make sure you add to your SSP to bring you up to CMMC level three. Um, as you go through here, there are a couple to be aware of that add some rigor that was not part of 800-171. And it's, it's somewhat difficult to see as with all control sets, there's always a, a bit of a bugaboo control in there. And I think in those first ones, when you look at AU348, um, again, you'll see the numbering uh, and naming convention that I was talking about. This is AU, meaning the domain, audit, and accountability, uh, dot three, meaning level three control, and control specifically number 48. Uh, collect audit information, logs, and the one or more central repositories. So this is a new control, and what it does is really take the bar for audits from keep logs uh, to keep them in one central place. And as soon as you start trying to take logs from one place and store them in another, you're talking about some kind of mechanism. So this is an example of a single control that was added by CMMC, but really takes an entire domain, the audit and accountability domain, and raises the level of rigor and attention to detail that needs to go into it for you to have the right capabilities that implement the right practices to achieve what CMMC would consider um, the necessary minimum. A couple others in here. IR is the next on the list. This detect, report, analyze words are a little bit more strict in the uh, IR writing for CMMC. It does not um, take away the DFARS requirements for reporting issues with CUI um, when found, but it does add a level of granularity to help you understand uh, more than what was written in the NIST 800-171 control set. You also see recovery in here. Recovery is a section that was alluded to in 800-171 and is uh, called out directly in the new control set. Obviously, there's a lot of other ones in here. Don't have time to go through all of them. Um, the rest of this presentation, I intend to go through each of the domains. So here's a full list of the domains. And to talk about some of the best practices and how I approach these. Um, my takeaway that I'd, I'd hope that your takeaway from this would be to understand as someone who goes through these controls on a regular basis uh, with a whole bunch of different customers, how I tend to approach each of these and what I would look for in terms of key uh, delineators between pass fail and some of the uh, more difficult parts of each of these. So as we talk about each of them, it's important to keep in mind that you're going to end up with a process maturity rating. And that process maturity rating, as you think about where you're at, um, you should be able to think, do we get to ML3 managed? Um, if not, you're, you're looking at some kind of deficiency on that control, whether it's effectively in place, is still not going to be observable enough to pass an audit. So a big part of CMMC is going to be building an observable system uh, that's documented and that has um, an easy way to communicate it to your auditor for the most part. So with each of those, those domains, um, keep that in mind. All right, so let's move right on into the domains themselves, access control. Access control is a hard place to start. 
So these controls are all going to be in alphabetical order, and you're probably going to write them into your system security plan, which is your driving document, has all your controls in it. If you haven't seen a system security plan before, I would recommend you maybe download uh, from the FedRAMP.gov template site, the FedRAMP one. It's going to be much more rigorous than you need, but it should give you at least an idea of what a system security plan does look like in the FedRAMP audit world. And you can also download some NIST documentation for a much more generic system security plan, and you're probably going to want to land somewhere between the two. But when you're doing your system security plan, the first set of controls you're going to write down are going to come with AC if you go in order. My first suggestion is don't go in order. This really, I think, is step number four in the SSP writing. And for anyone who's never written an SSP, I would very much recommend that you take a step back, skip this one to start, move down to personnel security, um, answer some questions about screening, much simpler to write, answer some, and then move to awareness and training as your second domain. I would third move to identification and authentication, which I'll talk about in order. But I would do those three domains, personnel security, awareness and training, identification and authentication first, write down your answers to those sections, and then come back to uh, access control. And I say that because it's going to be really hard to answer some of these questions if you haven't talked about who are our authorized users. Um, have we actually done background checks on these people? It really helps you to get a sense of who and uh, what are we aiming at with our access control family before you start to dive into what are otherwise pretty difficult, um, pretty difficult controls to answer. So once you've gone and done one, two, three, and you've written them down, you're going to come back to access control and you're going to talk about control the flow of CUI. Again, a simple control to write down, a difficult control to understand. Control the flow of CUI. In order to do this, you need to figure out where does CUI live in my environment. I would suggest looking at your contracts, talking to your PMs, talking to your engineers, looking for data, data that's marked. Um, in previous presentations, the L3 Hires team has made clear that they're there to support you guys. They've been marking their documentation. If you have questions, you should be reaching out upward to them. Um, but once you've gotten a handle on, okay, we have CUI, it goes from system to system, you're going to draw what's called a data flow diagram. This diagram is of critical importance to the entirety of the rest of your SSP and how you'll answer all the rest of these questions. So um, get your diagram drawn out. Where does data go from place to place? And then really you want to move through privileged access. Um, and when I say privilege, I mean domain admin or security groups with local admin or role-based privileges. Things like installing software, changing operating system configuration, remote access to end user workstations. You'll need to move through all of your privilege access controls in this family. Um, and then you really need to look at verify and control and limit external connections. So again, this is a big family and a difficult one. And so we've, we've gone through data flow diagram, which was hard. You've talked about privileged access for internal users, which is difficult as well. And now you're going to talk about external connections. So your data flow diagram is going to be critical in doing this. Who has access to this data inbound? And where does this data go outbound? And you're going to want to draw some pictures with some arrows and use that to build out the rest of your understanding of who are our vendors, which of these vendors have CMMC compliance requirements for themselves, which don't. Um, so all in one domain here, we've covered really three difficult topics um, before you even get into the kind of, okay, let's talk about users now, regular access control. And they really end with a doozy on encrypt CUI on mobile devices and mobile computing platforms, which helps us move to the next control family. Um, when we hey, talk David, about me, mobile devices, me, we're talking about assets. Bring a, David, let me bring an audience question if I could. Um, yeah. Question related to access control is, will shared accounts be phased out? If not, is maintaining a list of users who know the shared account password sufficient? Um, when you, whenever you're going to say sufficient, you're going to be asking an auditor if they believe it's sufficient. So to not give any kind of clear answer that would be very helpful, always maybe. If you have shared passwords and they're necessary for service accounts, um, you need to justify why they exist. And it would be more ideal if the place that you have them stored has some capability to tell me if they've been accessed by one user or another. So tools like KeePass, great for storing shared passwords, not as great often for who accessed a stored password 
or knowing if one's been stolen. Some of the more advanced technologies for password, to, you know, password and, and secret storage are, are a little bit more robust in that space. So be careful with how you do it. Are they allowed? It's not an outright ban, um, but how you manage the data to them, you need to make sure you're still meeting the unique user requirement so that you can always identify which unique individual was behind the account. All right, so let's move on. Asset management. You can see there is way less controls in this family, uh, in this domain. So the asset management domain is really about uh, it, maintaining an inventory. So you are doing your data flow diagram. You understand where you get this stuff from and where it goes in terms of physical and digital media, and you're gonna create an inventory of hardware, uh, things like on-premise router, switch, firewall, server, NAS, SAN, um, hardware for employees, workstations, mobile devices, tablets, external storage, printers, wireless access points, all of those things would be assets. They'd all go in your inventory and then any, any, any of your virtual assets. So virtual servers, virtual storage, um, if you have a full software defined data center model, all of your virtual um, stack should also be in your inventory. For level three, this is very likely to be manual. Uh, level four gets into proactively figuring out if your manual inventory is correct. <clears throat> but at level three, you're probably going to look like a spreadsheet or an asset management tool of some kind, um, either with manual monthly updates um, or some more automated techniques. Big organizations will always benefit from tool sets here. Smaller organizations probably can get away with uh, a more manual process. So. We've talked about um, moving through this whole process and really starting, we haven't gotten to the domains yet with personnel security, awareness training, identification and authentication, moving to access control is number four, asset management is number five. At this point, when you get to the audit and accountability family, um, those things are really prerequisites. They must be done. This has a 100% coverage requirement. If you've not identified all of the assets involved, virtual and, uh, virtual and physical, you really can't do this family effectively. So it really starts with reviewing all your assets, reviewing all your external connections, evaluating which of these systems can produce event logs. Um, just to take a step back, an event on a computer is just any activity, user authenticated, uh, an adverse event, is something that happened on a workstation that may be bad, user failed authentication, and they're stored in a event log itself. And we wanna get that event log so that we can have it for forensics, so that we can later on answer the question, who did what, when, to whom, um, in hopes of answering why. So this area is, is open-ended and purposely open-ended, and it's gonna require you to prove to your auditor that you've thought this through and they're gonna to wanna to see that you've thought it through by looking at all your assets, all your external systems, what logs can be produced, which logs would be of value to enable forensics, and then what did you put in place to actually collect those logs centrally? Did you focus on collecting only valuable logs? Have they been normalized into something that's searchable for all of your analyst team? And have you integrated that whole thing into your incident response family? So this is a difficult area, um, but it, again, as a prerequisite, you need to have 100% coverage. You need to understand what your asset inventory looks like uh, before you can really take this one on. Okay, awareness and training. Awareness and training is pretty straightforward. There's nothing special in here from what was in 800-171. Uh, the key distinctions for you to pay attention to are insider threats, um, and to make sure that you have a way to sh observe, for the auditor to observe that you put training in place. So many people say, yeah, we send them a PowerPoint. Um, you're gonna want them to sign some kind of documentation or have a digital record that they went and watched this documentation. Um, if you can't show the auditor that they really did it, it, it's not gonna be an easy, area to pass and that's kind of the one hold up most people do training most people have a good training program most people have not done enough to uh, necessarily make it easy to show the auditor that they're doing that 
Um, the last thing on here, role-based training. When they say role-based training, it's really about people who have a role on the security team, incident response, recovery, and understanding that these people, in order to fulfill that role, need to be taught how to do specific things, which procedures in your company apply to them. So make sure you identify stakeholders on those teams and that you sit down together and do some incident response training, uh, recovery training, where you teach them how to use the tools in hand and what their role on that team is. Configuration management. Um, I'll start out by saying a lot of people are moving to using SaaS products. SaaS is great. It does not mean that it's not at all involved with you. You still have to configure your SaaS products. If you're using SaaS products in the CMMC world, your SaaS products need to have FedRAMP compliance. Your FedRAMP compliant providers will have a customer responsibility matrix as one of the documents they were required to prepare for FedRAMP audit. And they should be able to deliver that, um, that document to you. As a SaaS provider especially, it should look something like you must bring your own multi-factor authentication tool, um, or you must go into our tool and enable multi-factor authentication. Office 365 is a great example. You can buy it and not turn on MFA. If you didn't turn on MFA, you failed in your own configuration management. You didn't install and use uh, software or software as a service with a secure baseline. So you need to pay attention not only to your own internal configuration management of your own hardware and virtual uh, machines and software, but you do need to also make sure you understand your vendors and how your vendors uh, require configuration management. So I think the main takeaway from this um, is, a, is a much broader attention to not only your internal configuration management, but external as well. So you should be relying on your data flow diagram and on your list of external systems, um, your asset management inventory to understand your baseline. You want to follow a principle of least necessary privileges um, and least necessary capabilities. And then you want to implement controlled changes, none of which is new, all of which is difficult especially in high, um, highly transitive environments where you're making a lot of changes. All right, identification and authentication. This family is really about uh, identifiers is where it starts. So how do you identify devices? How do you identify people before they get on the network so that you can uniquely identify them and hold them accountable for the behavior that happened? on their device or with their accounts. Um, so I typically would call this number three when I'm writing an SSP. I would have done personnel security. I would have talked about training. And now I'm gonna talk about, okay, you've got a new employee, they've gotten training. How do they get a device? And how do they get an account in the system? So I typically would write this as number three in my SSP. Um, I would be asking questions about unique accounts, and then I'd right away start asking about shared accounts. So I think the question earlier about uh, storing passwords to shared accounts, um, is it allowed to have them? If you must have an account, you must have an account. So service accounts in technology do exist. How you protect them and make sure that the individuals who get access to those credentials can be traced um, is it becomes the difficult part. So. Um, the next, for pretty much the rest of the section on um, NIA after identifiers is going to be about picking good passwords. Those ones are all pretty straightforward. And then I really would call your attention to the control IA2081. Um, and this is going to be about protecting passwords at rest and in transit. And another simple written control, but difficult to show to the auditor. So this is gonna to have to do with you telling the auditor, my passwords live in this vault. It's also gonna to have to do with you telling your auditor, in transit, passwords are encrypted like this. So it's gonna require you to write about uh, TLS 1.2 and Ike V2 and different um, algorithms and ciphers and how they work, um, Windows and TLM hashes, and have some sense to the auditor of, no, we're not passing clear text passwords around our environment. And that's simple to say, difficult to show, and typically is going to be done on your data flow diagram and your external system connections diagrams, 
where you are going to put some of those protocols and that information on there so you can prove to the auditor uh, how you meet this one control. Incident response. Um, again, nothing, nothing necessarily special about this from a uh, NIST 853 perspective, but fairly more strict than NIST 800-171. Um, I think adding some of the detection, adding some of the statements around practicing and having predefined procedures for responding to incidents has added a little bit more rigor to this. So I would encourage you, if you did do 800-171 to the T, to come back and, and check this section and make sure you're doing all of your testing, for instance, and that you have detection capabilities with alarms um, in place. So overall, my suggestion to all companies is when it comes to predefined procedures, I would look at malware on workstations, uh, on servers and in your SaaS storage, on SharePoint, for instance. I would absolutely look at ransomware at this point on a single workstation or ransomware uh, for denial of service. So somebody trying to kick you out of your system and take control of it and make you pay a ransom. Um, you'll want to practice those things and you'll want to understand the implications of the uh, workstation or server being in office or remote. Um, what kind of things you would do to escalate, who would and how would they contain, um, and how do you hand off to your recovery plan. All of those things are critical to get into your incident response. Uh, program, I typically recommend to customers to come out with an incident response plan, a standalone plan document that describes all of the procedures and uh, practices necessary to meet this this domain. Hey David, got a audience mm -hmm. question here is can you can you give a definition of an incident? So um, incidents and suspected incidents, the way that you define those terms is going to be personal to you. Uh, I tend to look at it as an event has occurred and an event with um, a potential to cause problems would be an adverse event. Um, adverse events, if you keep going through the NIST 861 Computer Security Incident Handling Guide, you'd be getting into precursors and indicators. Um, precursors, things that maybe, hey, here's a heads up from the CISA that this is happening around the world. It could be a precursor of a, an attack happening to you or an indicator. We've seen some log activity that seems weird or a malware event went off. Um, so those are all up front. And then you have to do analysis internally to determine if the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of a known piece of data has been compromised. Um, so you're going to talk about data itself, and when we talk about compromise or security incident, you're typically talking about one of those three, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability, having been compromised. So that's, I think, in its most basic sense, um, the moment that you would realize an incident, a real security incident, a reportable security incident, if it involves CUI, has occurred. The other thing, too, is if you're, if you're looking at um, the DFARS uh, 7012 clause, it does have a definition of a, of a cyber incident, and that defines incidents that are reportable to the Department of Defense. So I would say from a legal perspective, um, you know, in addition to what David said in terms of operationally managing those incidents, from a legal perspective, you should look at the DFARS definition, and if the event meets that definition, then it's reportable to the DOD. That's correct, and I think it's important in your IR plan to have those definitions. And I, like I said, highly recommend having a definition for a security incident that is separate from a reportable cyber incident under the DFARS clause, because you may have things that involve, you know, a stolen password, but no data was stolen. It was an incident. We responded, but we don't need to go talk to the DOD about it. It didn't have anything to do with them. So definitely want to pay attention to, to those words and define them very clearly in your incident response plan. Uh, maintenance. So maintenance is not a very difficult um, section of controls. It's not hard to wrap your head around. Um, many of you are going to be moving, hopefully, to uh, something a little bit more cloud-based where you're not necessarily maintaining on-premise equipment. If you are maintaining on-premise equipment, hopefully you've moved to some kind of co-location center, which is going to do on-premise protection for you way, way better and provide a lot of maintenance to you in a secure way. And if you're really doing all of this on-premise, 
you're going to need to go back to the book and think about how do we make sure that anybody coming in and out of our building, um, we know who they are. So do we have a shared building with shared um, personnel from the building that can walk around and work on our plumbing? And can they get into my data center? And have I accounted for that in, in the controls around protecting my um, systems from authorized or unauthorized or related maintenance activities? So um, for many of you, this is not going to be a difficult section. If you are maintaining an on-premise data center uh, in an office location type of a thing, you'll, you'll need to give this section a little bit more thought. Media protection is really about um, the term media, not necessarily like news media. It has to do with storage media. So um, storage media in a digital sense, you're talking about a hard drive, a flash drive, USB drive, um, the storage in a printer comes to mind, the storage in a laptop. Um, if it's got something that data can be stored on in a digital way, it's considered media. Um, physical media would include paper, um, film, I think is another great example. CDs kind of bridge the line between physical and digital media. Um, but in general, this whole family or domain is about understanding where that stuff lives, um, understanding if it can be removed from the original device it was in. If it is removed, that it's marked at its most um, removable level. So if you've got a USB drive that stores CUI, and it can be moved around and you want that to be the case, that's fine. You just need to know that that removable media um, is approved and probably is labeled with some kind of marking indicating uh, what it is and how it's supposed to be protected. Otherwise, you're mostly talking about the storage inside of a computer. You're gonna wanna label your computers or understand what they are by device ID. Um, and then probably you're looking at using full disk encryption um, or encryption in general to protect the media at rest. All right, personnel security. Uh, this is my favorite family to start the SSP. I often find that, especially in any organizations working with the DOD, that um, screening has been well well implemented, typically relies on a third party. Uh, typically the process is pretty well understood. So I would suggest if you've never written an SSP and you're just about to start, go find these couple controls, uh, work with your human capital or human resources um, stakeholders to document how this process goes down. And that'll really get you started into your SSP and give you a sense of it. I typically move from here right into awareness and training and I like to end up with some kind of uh, diagram, a racy diagram, for instance, that really under, kind of depicts the handoff when a new hire comes in, when someone transfers from one role to another, um, or when someone is terminated from the company and separates. Physical protection, um, much like I said about media and maintenance, for many of you that are moving to a more cloud-based system, physical protection is gonna get simpler and simpler. For those of you that have moved beyond a, uh, what I'll call physical-centric kind of a protection to a data-centric protection model using things like DLP, AIP, physical protection gets less and less important as you start to put a wrapper around individual pieces of data where maybe it doesn't matter what device, BYOD, it ends up living on. So. Um, these controls are simple for an old world, start to become a little bit more complex to document if you're moving into a more modern uh, security design that relies more heavily on a uh, hosted desktop or VDI or full SaaS-based programs. Um, physical protection is going to be a little bit more difficult for you to document how exactly you comply with these things. My advice and the advice given to us from uh, FedRAMP typically is don't mark these as not applicable as much as mark them as in place with a kind of, yes, we have a policy. And if we were to need these protections for visitors, we would implement them. So just a word of caution um, as you write this section out, if you are in this more modern, modern uh, design, do be careful with how you answer them. Um, be wary of writing not applicable uh, all over the place.
recovery. So this is a new family. Um, it was alluded to as part of NIST 800-171, as you very likely are doing this or must do this based on your contract. It is now explicitly written into the control set, and um, you do need to understand what your requirements are. The best way to start this is to understand your recovery point objective and your recovery time objective. Uh, the recovery point is basically how long can you go where if, if it crashed and it was as bad as it got, how much data would you lose? So if you back up daily, your recovery point is 24 hours. You would never lose more than 24 hours uh, before that point where you took your last backup. Your recovery time objective is gonna be about how long is it gonna take me to restore and start working again once I realize the thing broke. Um, so you may take a backup every 24 hours, but it may take you three weeks to recover from that backup. If that's the case, your recovery time uh, in, in all reality would be three weeks in one day. If that's your objective and that meets your SLAs and that meets your risk tolerance, um, you may be able to convince your auditor that that's what the regular basis should look like. Um, but you need to give some thought to when I promise services upstream um, and downstream, what kind of SLAs am I, am I giving and can I meet those with my recovery program? Um, this is another area that gets complex enough that I typically see people writing a recovery plan, a standalone plan. It contains all of their procedures and practices related to this domain. Um, word to the wise, ransomware is becoming a very big issue. So as you write your recovery plan, do not just write it for natural disasters. Um, do consider the concept that you would be maybe locked out of your system and how will you deal with that particular issue. Uh, how can you recover if, you're, if your backups are uh, taken away from you? So offline backup may become more important, um, but be aware that that is changing the landscape in the recovery world. Uh, risk management, nothing too special here. This is pretty much the way it's been for forever. You need to do risk assessment. You need to understand your risk posture and uh, pretty much following the risk management framework that NIST published long ago is still the guidance here. Um, the third bullet down there, vulnerability scanning. Uh, vulnerability scanning is the process of using an automated tool to reach out to a system and figure out what weaknesses exist on that system that an attacker could take advantage of. You need to be doing that on a regular basis. This is the starting point for many, many, many attackers. If you aren't aware of these vulnerabilities beforehand and haven't fixed them, um, this is very likely going to be the path to compromise for you um, should an attacker get inside your network or should an attacker look at your external facing systems. Um, so you want to conduct vulnerability scans of everything internal and you want to conduct vulnerability scans of your external footprint, uh, which is what an attacker would see from the general internet. Security assessment, again, nothing very special here. This is the bread and butter of this entire control set. Go through each control and write down what is the solution and how is it implemented. And that's gonna become your system security plan, your SSP. Um, it's, it's really the golden document of all of this and it should take you from zero to understanding the environment. It's gonna be the most crucial document to give to your auditor. It needs to be well written. Um, I would definitely write it in the active voice. Avoid extra writing. It's definitely not going to impress an auditor if it's 5,000 pages long. Um, you want to make it a good piece of technical writing with a lot of pictures, a lot of bulleted lists, and a lot of references um, to keep the amount of data in there uh, reasonable, despite how much information really does need to end up in this document. So this plan, the system security plan, will be complemented typically by a recovery plan, by an incident response plan. Um, this SSP in particular, though, will document the procedures and practices for nearly all of your domains, where the other two I mentioned will be domain-specific. Um, so the output of the SSP is a document indicating every control, whether it's in place or not. If it's not in place, it goes on your plan of action and milestones report. Um, you need to put some milestones around when you intend to fix them based on risk. So your uh, SSP and your POAM are very closely related. And the other thing you're going to get out of this SA, uh, or sorry, CA 
family is to build a continuous monitoring plan where you understand all the things you need to do uh, and put them on a schedule and then actually achieve them. Situational awareness is very straightforward. Sign up for threat intelligence uh, from the US CERT and everybody else in this list. These guys send out really valuable data. Uh, CISA just sent out a really good one, CISA, on Friday about DNS. If you haven't updated your DNS, you were supposed to do it by Friday of last week, so you do need to go in and apply the patch from Microsoft for this month. Um, those kinds of briefings are required and you should be getting them. All right, these next two sections. I am not gonna go into too much detail about them. They are very system specific. Um, typically, I recommend these being things that you would put some metadata in these controls as you're going through your uh, SSP, get a sense of, for instance, split tunneling. What is it? How does it apply to your environment? Is it required for you? Um, or is this a control where you're going to be trying to write an alternate implementation? Um, some of these are going to require purchases of technical, uh, or sorry, per hardware purchases to meet some of the technical requirements. So as you look at your firewalls and web proxies, you really need to understand, can this firewall at its current throughput with its current power handle all the things that's, that I'm being asked? So while I wouldn't recommend writing the answers to these in all that much detail uh, on your first pass, I would recommend making sure that there are no technical gaps that are going to require expensive purchases. Firewalls can get expensive really quickly. Um, so, you know, control by control, no, um, no in-depth advice. I would say definitely pay attention to split tunneling. I think that's one of the most difficult in here. Um, but otherwise, this is, this is probably a, a good section to leave for later on in your assessing. And the last one on here is much the same system and information integrity, I would recommend leaving it toward a little bit later. Um, but again, you should be able to at least check the box here. Do I have spam protection? Do I have an IDS IPS device? Do, am I doing malicious code prevention? If no, you probably have to buy a piece of technology. Um, and I think the other key takeaway from this section is patch management. If you have happened to, or if you have not implemented vulnerability scanning, you're not going to be able to do patch management effectively. So you need to be aware, do I have the technology necessary for this uh, SI domain? And also, am I implementing uh, the prerequisites so that I can actually accomplish this, this domain's capabilities um, in an effective way? All right, so that covers all the 17 domains. Um, my hope again is that you got some tidbits out of each of those sections as to what you can do to get through some of those. Um, and I think as you want further guidance, start to realize some of those are a little bit more difficult than you expected. Um, we very much hope that you'll be able to use the NEO Smart Portal um, that L3 Harris has sponsored and NEO Systems has built as that place to get guidance of this kind. So the gap analysis. Um, the process that you're going to use to get through from where you are today to actually passing an audit with a C3PAO um, is, is really drawn out on the NEO Smart Portal, and we really recommend you get there. Uh, NEO Systems also can help. We're an MSP, Managed Service Provider. Our security services um, very much are focused on CMMC and government contractors. So we've written a lot of system security plans, done a lot of POAMs. Um, we've put ourselves through the FedRAMP program as a cloud service provider. So we're able to offer a fairly unique set of managed security uh, services that are complemented by managed IT, managed hosting, um, or sorry, managed application and FedRAMP hosting to give a pretty full package to help where you need or to take on the full shebang for you. So with that, I'd love to open it up to questions. Ten minutes left, and I can tell that there are a bunch of them. So, um, Ed, David, I would I'll start with, probably appreciate ahead, I'll, some of your questions off the bat. I'll start with a couple of the administrative questions that have come in from the audience from various people about whether the slide deck will be available and whether the webinar is being recorded. So the answer to both those questions is yes. 
Um, the NeoSmart portal will have a uh, recording of this available for on demand. If you have other people in your organization that you'd like to hear it, then they can listen to it on demand. And then there's also going to be a PDF of the slides. So if you just want the slideware, uh, it's good reference material that will be available there as well. Uh, and with that, I'll move it to a couple of questions that are um, directed at L3 Harris. Um, the first one is, is it L3 Harris's expectation for suppliers that do not share, generate, share, excuse me, let me restart over. Is it L3 Harris's expectations for suppliers that do not handle, share, or generate covered defense information in the performance of their services to adhere to these parameters? I guess so the question is, will you need CMMC even if you don't have any CDI in your possession? Anyone from L3 want to so take that? Yes, this is uh, Joe Palvino, Government Compliance, L3 Harris. So today we were focusing specifically in this webinar on CMMC Level 3, which is required if you have CUI, CDI. If you are an L3 Harris supplier that does not have CUI or CDI, the DOD contracts may still require you be CMMC Level 1, but you would not be required to be Level 3. Thank you. Um, another question for L3 Harris uh, goes to marking of data. Um, in a, there's a couple different questions, so I'll kind of paraphrase these. Um, is the is the intent that the data will be marked at the time it's delivered from L3 Harris, or do contractors need to worry about information that, that may not be marked or that they may generate themselves? Okay. I'm not sure. Sorry. Oh, nope. I'm sorry. sorry. My phone was on. My phone was on mute there. So, a lot of that's going to be contract specific. Uh, L3 Harris is sending out specific CUI, CDI data. It will be marked accordingly. However, if we are requiring a supplier to generate information, then the marking guidelines would be flowed as part of the contract and would have to be marked in accordance with those guidelines. Very good. And um, uh, also for L3 Harris, you may have you may answered this a little bit already, which is how do contractors know what level they need to obtain? So you mentioned that based on the, on the data, but how will they know on a contract by contract basis uh, what level is required? Um, a lot of that, we're still getting information from the government and how they are flowing it as part of the prime contracts, but it would be specified in the RFIs and RFPs that are sent out and then further detailed in the statement of works or the specifications sent for any potential sub-tier contracts that may need to be issued to support an L3 Harris order. Very good. Um, I, and, uh, I would add to that um, Ed, Ed Bassett's earlier presentation on um, understanding CMMC. Uh, I think the first one in the presentation list, uh, the first of the five that we did, goes into a whole lot of detail about what is this, what can you expect, what are the time frames. Um, if you have broader questions, I think that is an excellent place to start as far as what is the current guidance from the government. Uh, next question is um, um, perhaps a technical question for L3 Harris. It says, is it required that all subcontractor contracts that contain CUI data contain a government contract number? I've heard salespersons say they have the DFARS 7012 requirement, but they don't have a DOD contract number. Hi, this is Julian Smith uh, with L3 Harris. I'll take a stab at that one. Uh, it, it feels to me like uh, certainly the 7012 clause is what will drive our action. Um, there are some contracts as, as to how they get become translated as they flow uh, throughout the supply chain where the uh, DOD contract number may not be flowed with it. Uh, I would recommend that the supplier certainly uh, look for the 7012 clause as to what would uh, drive their action. But if there was a question about it, that's a fine question to be able to ask to ensure that uh, you're in a place of compliance. Very good. Um, David, a couple of questions for you on the requirements. Uh, the first one is, do we only need to mark CUI media that is sent from the prime marked as CUI? So this goes to media marking and I guess what to expect from the uh, from the prime as well. 
So media marking does include understanding that if you create information um, as, as part of the contract you're working on, engineering firms would fall in this category. If part of the data you're creating under your contract is uh, once assembled CUI, um, it's not data that's going to come to you from L3 Harris or other primes as marked because it's data you'd be creating. So if, if that's part of your business model, I highly suggest you get a, advice from uh, legal teams um, about exactly how that's supposed to be marked and what your requirements are in handling it internally um, and separate from your prime contractors, but in performance of contracts they gave you. Um, this may be about marking, maybe about data. It says, uh, does data derived from CUI, such as mach machine control files for manufacturing that represent a smaller subset of the customer data and aren't human readable, do those need to be considered CUI? Examples might be G-code for a uh, CNC machine or an inspection control file for an electrical test. So I'll say likely no, but as a, an information security professional, I would couch that in saying talk to someone with a legal background. Um, but in my experience, know that that kind of broken down data, um, unless reassembled, does not typically represent CUI or would not need to be marked in that particular way. Again, that's just my experience as an information security professional. I would certainly not make that your be all end all. Um, I will say that metadata related to systems um, is only considered uh, controlled in a way if it impacts the overall security of the system. So you can play that forward a little bit with um, individual components and pieces and parts of information. Um, if they're not readable, if in their own they don't represent something that could impact the security or uh, of the DOD, then likely no. Um, you, you, you have to realize this is applying to many, many contractors out there and is supposed to be achievable. So they are going to draw the line at some point. Um, next question that says, is encryption required for data at rest or only for removable media? Um, data at rest needs to be protected. Um, encryption might be the right way to do so, but there is no hard and fast requirement um, that it is the be all end all. Um, if encryption is used, it needs to be FIPS 140-2 validated. You need to protect your media. You need to protect your data. If Again, if encryption is the right mechanism um, for every single piece, then, then yes. But again, at rest for physical media, like a piece of paper, obviously it's not going to be encrypted. So it's not a be all end all answer there. And we got a few questions about uh, the requirement for encryption to be FIPS 140-2 validated. And uh, what types of encryption does that apply to? And I, I think the short answer there is, if you're using encryption, as you mentioned, David, it's not the only choice in some cases, but if you choose encryption to protect the data, then that encryption has to be FIPS 140-2 validated. Do you agree with that? I do, and that um, often is difficult with software that someone else built. And if they don't have a FIPS 140-2 mode built into the software, you really aren't going to be able to take advantage of the software to do this for you. So recommendation would be to look for tools that maybe can um, wrap your data while it's in transit between two systems in a FIPS 140-2 validated um, container, if you will. So something like a you know, VPN tunnel with FIPS 140-2 validation could be a great workaround or mitigation to um, you connecting to a web server that maybe doesn't offer FIPS 140-2 validated TLS encryption right out of the box. Um, we have just about a minute left, so I'll just have one more question, and then we'll see if anyone from Beltry Harris would like to make any closing remarks. Um, last question is, uh, David, if you could repeat what you mentioned about the uh, announcement on DNS and DNS security, um, just maybe give a pointer sure. to where people could look for more information there. Yeah, actually, that's probably the most timely thing you'll hear today. The DNS uh, servers, Microsoft DNS servers, are have a critical vulnerability and needs to be patched ASAP. The Microsoft uh, roll-up patches for this month, um, the July 2020 security update, contains updates to your DNS servers. So whatever server in your environment is doing DNS, typically a domain controller, you need to get on that box and apply the July 2020 security update as of Friday at 2 o'clock Eastern last week. 
So if you haven't done that, you're not in compliance, you need to get it done rapidly. The next thing you need to do is apply the July 2020 update to all of the rest of your servers as of this Friday. So um, the CISA published that, and you can find that publication if you search CISA DNS, uh, you, it'll pop up. And the requirements for you specifically in the DOD world will be there for any federal information, in fact, that you need to go through uh, DNS servers first and uh, the rest of your the rest of your servers in your environment next. Very good. All right. Thanks, David. Um, I will I will mention we have two additional uh, webinars coming up. Um, there's a next webinar is going to cover CMC levels four and five for those of you who need to address those levels. And the last one uh, will be about the audit and assessment experience. And we'll have a, a presentation partner uh, who's someone who's in the business of doing those, those CMC assessments. So please check those out. Uh, Neo Smart Portal has the dates for those. You can register on there uh, as well. Again, you can also go to the portal to get access to, to those and other upcoming events, as well as the uh, on-demand replays of, of past events. Um, I'll turn it over to Elfie Harris if you have any, any closing remarks you'd like to like to send us off with. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you very much for your time. This is Jeff Baldwin from L3 Harris. Um, as always, if you have any questions, just shoot them over to cybersecurity underscore SC at L3Harris.com and we'll get answers for you. And the other thing that's also on the NeoSmart portal is a couple links to different FAQs, frequently asked questions that may, you may find pretty helpful. So with that, thank you, and thanks for attending. I'll see you at the next one.